Not long ago, a journalist called me up and asked me, whose papers do you look forward to reading more than any others? And my answer, without really hesitating, was Danny Roderick. So he's our guest today. He's arguably the world's leading and most important economist on trade, globalization, industrial policy, and lately the prerequisites for liberal democracy. His new book, which I'll mention again, Economics Rules, that's spelled R-U-L-E-S, why should I not read my own blurb? Quote, <laughs> the best economists make the best methodologists, and Danny Roderick is both. His economics rules is the single best source for explaining the strengths and weaknesses of economics to an outside audience. So we're going to start this conversation with some questions about some of your recent papers on this topic of premature deindustrialization. I find this one of the most interesting themes in your work. The notion that a mix of automation and competitive trade with wealthier nations might mean that poorer nations today will not be able to industrialize and follow the path of South Korea or Taiwan or Singapore. Now, if this is the case, if a lot of economies out there are deindustrializing prematurely before they've built up a significant middle class, what do you see happening, for instance, for the future of Africa? The parts of Africa which do relatively well but let's say they do not industrialize. What does that future look like in your vision? I, I don't think it, it means that uh, there is a very bleak future for the countries of, of sub-Saharan Africa. I, I just think that it's going to be uh, very difficult, if not impossible, for them to replicate the ra very rapid uh, convergence experience of the East and Southeast Asian uh, countries. Uh, so if you look throughout economic history, uh, the countries that have done have made that uh, very rapid leap uh, into um, middle income and beyond that uh, um, uh, advanced country status, um, starting from sort of the, the non-Western countries first, uh, Japan from the late 19th century onward, um, and then after the Second World War, um, South Korea, Taiwan, and then eventually, of course, uh, uh, China. Um, along with a number of countries that did more or less the same in the periphery of, the, of Western Europe, uh, closer to Western Europe, the one thing that's common in all of them is very rapid industrialization. Um, and with very rapid industrialization, you can get growth rates on a on per capita basis of 4 or 5% per year uh, on an ongoing basis for decade after decade. And that's sort of what's made, uh, you know, sort of South Korea what it is today um, uh, uh, in, in that kind of rapid growth. Uh, but that's a very um, sort of, if you will, a very exceptional kind of experience. Um, uh, I think th if the uh, possibilities of, of rapid industrialization are no longer there, as you suggest, I think um, uh, uh, they are, are in fact no longer there. Uh, what we're going to get is um, sort of slower growth, um, what I call growth that's based much more on sort of the, you know, the steady and, 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 uh, and, and hard um, sort of work of accumulating basic capabilities, human capital, uh, skills, institutional improvement, all of those things that are, are, are required for the long run but don't produce the kind of 4%, 5% growth on, an, on, a, on a per annum basis as we've seen in those rapid uh, growth countries. But say, let's think of it from a political economy point of view. So South Korea has done very well exporting, and that created for them a set of interest groups which were willing to fund that infrastructure, bring the whole country together, so to speak. Uh, you end up with a middle class being built rapidly. That middle class is the foundation for a democracy. And the special interest groups behind the infrastructure, it's clear who they are, and they win almost every political battle, even without a democracy. You see some version of the same in China. So the countries that don't industrialize, could you imagine them having an ongoing kind of ramshackle existence where consumer goods flood in at cheap prices, they grow at 4% instead of 10%, but Lagos in a way always looks a bit like current Lagos and never looks like Seoul, South Korea. And what's even a developed country? Maybe in, in some fundamental psychological sense changes. Yeah, I think what, what matters here are, is probably less the quantitative side, how rapidly you're growing, but sort of the qualitative things that are happening during the growth process. You have to bear in mind that, you know, sort of our, 
archetypal, successful industrialization growth, liberal democracy kind of countries, in fact, never experienced the kind of growth rate that Japan and South Korea or China did. Um, you know, the, in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, the uh, Great Britain was growing at rates that uh, we would scoff at today for any emerging uh, uh, market. Uh, so it, it wasn't the growth itself that enabled the, um, the development of a middle class and the emergence of and the spread of liberal values and, and the creation of a liberal democracy, but the kind of, of, of you know, the, the transformation of the economy and its social structure in a particular kind of a way, uh, you know, if you will, the, you know, the spread of, of you know, bourgeois liberal values, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the restraints placed on, on the state in terms of how much it could do and on, under what kind of circumstances. And you're right that in countries like Nigeria and many others which have had very rapid population growth where the urban areas have swollen with people from the countryside, I think sort of managing these kinds of tensions, especially when you're in a sort of open economy and, and the markets are being flooded by cheap consumer goods from elsewhere, managing these transitions are, are uh, very difficult, especially since uh, these countries, and Af Africa of course particularly so, are, are um, torn apart by a number of additional cleavages of ethnic language, uh, um, uh, um, uh, regional, uh, tribal, and so forth. And, and so those are all things that are making it very, very difficult for these countries. I'm not so sure that rapid growth would necessarily have eliminated these kinds of problems. In, in, in some ways, it might even aggravate them. Uh, think, for example, that in the... Um, the, a, the, the um, the Arab Spring, the kind of troubles and the riots um, that started the Arab Spring uh, um, arose not in those parts of the Arab world which had had the least amount of development, but in fact in those countries like Tunisia and Egypt, uh, which had had the most rapid development. Uh, and it wasn't just uh, GDP growth per se. Tunisia was, was always an exemplar of uh, improvements in, in, in human and social development. Civil society. Uh, civil society, <laughs> improvements in health, improvements in education. Of course, it was an authoritarian regime. Uh, but, you know, you know, it would be, you, you had uh, the UN Development Program, the World Bank sort of touting the uh, Tunisian example of, of, of sort of in, in the Middle East as an Arab country that had done very well. Uh, so I think it's, it's less the rate of growth and, and then uh, sort of what is happening um, sort of underneath that in terms of the, the overall structure. And, there's, and there you have many, many different paths that are possible. So I, I, you know, I really believe in, in um, sort of one of my favorite uh, economists is Albert Hirschman. And, and for a while, I, two years I occupied the chair. It was named after him at the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, and he, he coined the term uh, sort of, of possibilism, which was the notion that, that as much as, as in social science you think you want to generate theories, sort of deterministic theories of, you know, sort of, you know, you have the industrialization and then, the, you know, the urbanization and then the bourgeoisie and that's going to generate capitalist democracy and so forth. A lot of what happens is, is just, you know, sort of, um, uh, 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 maneuvering around uh, the kind of constraints that geography and history um, ha have bequeathed and doing things that otherwise might not have seen possible. Uh, but that's, you know, if 50% is driven by sort of exogenous conditions, 50% is still basically in your hands is, is, is one way of looking at it. Uh, so I, I always look for sort of things in, in how you can sort of manipulate and maneuver. Uh, the context in which um, you, you, you find yourself in. And I think those possibilities always exist. Let me try to pin down a fundamental aspect of your thought that I see running through a lot of different papers. And that's the idea that there's something special about manufacturing. So as I understand you, if you do industrial policy and you get the right kind of manufacturing, it puts you on a better path. Your paper's on productivity convergence. Once you're started in manufacturing, according to your data, you get bigger ongoing gains than you do in agriculture. Catch up in agriculture is especially slow. Now, I find this intuitively plausible, but if we try to ask at the most foundationalist level, what is it exactly that's the difference between agriculture and manufacturing which accounts for this? What are the, the micro foundations of where that comes from? I think, uh, you know, a, a couple of things. One is that, uh, I, you know, manufacturing technology uh, 
uh, is much easily, much more easily transportable across uh, international borders. So it's much easier to adopt and adapt um, manufacturing technology. You can take a, you know, sort of a textile and clothing plant, and and sort of you still have to tinker it with it, but it's much easier to um, uh, to 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 transplant. Unlike many agricultural technologies, so we've seen that, for example, in the case of the Green Revolution, it required a lot of on-the-ground uh, adaptation because the weather and, and soil conditions can be very different. So if you will, the non-traded component of that technology transfer is much greater in agriculture. And for that matter, it's also in services. So you, know, you, you can figure out how you, to run a hospital system or education system in an advanced country you're never going to be able to just take that and transplant it in a developed country, in a developing country because, you know, technically speaking, the non-traded component of that uh, technology is, is uh, or the latent uh, adapt, you know, the part of the technology that requires adaptation to local context. Uh, so it's about the people so and the culture? Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's the, you know, in the case of agriculture, it's the soil and the weather. Uh, so it's not, I'm not saying, I don't want to say that, you know, some people are lazy and therefore, you know, or they're culturally not predisposed to this. I'm just but saying... that we see it in services suggests the weather and soil may be part of it, but they can't be driving it. Uh, well, what I'm saying, that, no, no, in services, I'm saying a lot of uh, services have been very difficult to transplant. For example, right. you know, uh, mobile telephony has been very easy. Sort of that like it just sort of stands out as one area, uh, but you know most of services are, are basically you know think about you know figuring out how to do education and health or systems. good healthcare systems uh, that, exactly. So that seems to make it culture. If you want to talk about culture, let's sort of open up a big uh, you know sort of parentheses and, and get into that because I I don't know exactly sort of uh, where you know institutions and organizations and incentives move into sort of a domain where we sort of start, you know, saying, you know, calling it culture. Um, you know, sort of culture is back in economics. I still have to be convinced that it's actually it's adding a significant amount to, to, to what we learn. But let me get back to the question about uh, manufacturing. Uh, so one thing I said is that, that you know, it, it's much easier to, to move technology. If you've right. seen the way that Toyota uh, manufactures cars uh, in, in Japan or in, in, in the United States or in South Africa, it's exact, more or less the same. Uh, and, and, and so that is possible. The se second thing which I think is, is, is sort of the, 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 the micro uh, economics of why it is that manufacturing is so special is that manufacturing standard traditional manufacturing like making cars or garments or toys or wigs has the feature that you, uh, you can absorb a lot of very unskilled workers into that because you know being a production worker even in an auto factory and certainly in a footwear factory doesn't take a whole lot of skill so that means that you can absorb a lot of people off the countryside in a much more rapid way than you could in a lot of other activities where technology and skill are actually highly complementary. So I, I, you know, sort of I heard once a, 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 um, a Chinese um, entrepreneur um, uh, sort of tell me that when they were, you know, it was, you know, she was running a footwear factory and she was hiring people from the countryside when the industry was, was starting. Uh, and basically, the only skill that was required to get that thing was going was not whether they could, you know, read, not whether they were numerate, but basically whether they could just do this with their hands. So, if you know, basic eye, you know, sort of, uh, you know, um, hand uh, coordination is all the skill that was required, and you could, you know, put thousands of people into these factories. Uh, so, the fact that you can absorb a lot of people, you can increase their productivity threefold, fourfold off the farm by putting them in these uh, 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 factories is, a, is an opportunity that very few other economic sectors provide. And the third, and I'll just mention a, a third thing which is very important in manufacturing, is tradable. So you don't have to develop a whole industrial complex. You can import the inputs and then export the outputs. So you don't require domestic demand to take off. So you don't require an economy-wide productivity um, a revolution in order to have con consumers to whom you can sell your output, you can simply sell it on world markets. What that means is that it's enough to develop mastery in one segment of manufacturing at a time, 
and that provides the kind of engine that you need. Compare that with the kind of, of transformation you need in services where most of the output has to be sold domestically. You need basically everybody's incomes to grow, every, every sector to experience a productivity increase so you have a large enough market that you can sell. Otherwise, any service sector that is doing really well eventually is going to experience very rapid uh, terms of trade uh, deterioration domestically. So those things, the, the, the transferability of the technology, the fact that it can absorb a lot of unskilled workers traditionally, this is what's changing, uh, um, off the countryside or out of informality and tradability, I think is sort of what makes really manufacturing historically has, been, mm -hmm. has made it special. A question about industrial policy. Now, I think we would agree in a number of the East Asian tigers, industrial policy has worked out pretty well. But take the case now, there's premature deindustrialization going on in many countries. It might be hard to reverse. Richard Baldwin writes of the splitting up of supply chains. So South Korea and Japan had relatively integrated supply chains. Now the supply chains are all around the globe. In a time like this, where manufacturing is changing rapidly, and policy itself is subject to a status quo bias, as we know from your own writings. What do you think is the new role for industrial policy, if any, and should we today perhaps not be more skeptical about it than we were, say, when Singapore started it? Uh, I think the answer to your last question is, 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 is yes. So I, although I wouldn't say we should be more skeptical, I think we should expect lower return. Uh, to it is 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 what I'd like to say simply because I think the possibilities of uh, you know sort of industrialization in the sense that you could put you know in, in the old days you know 30 35 percent of your labor force into manufacturing that is not going to happen you know sub-saharan Africa will not get there um, so what that means is that that the returns to even successful industrial policy these days is uh, is 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 less so that has a couple of implications one is that that increasingly I think you know, maybe we really need a different term. We shouldn't say industrial policy. Uh, maybe we should talk about a structural transformation policy that you know, your, your, your perspective in terms of how do you get rapid transformation, you should have move away from a little bit at the margin from manufacturing uh, into other parts of the economy. So I think you should be thinking more about services as well. A lot of services are tradable, so to some extent, uh, you know, some of, some of the um, advantages uh, might exist in, 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 in tradable services as well. Uh, the other thing which I think a lot of a, 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 mis a, a, a common mistake in industrial policy that low and middle income countries do, uh, which is to look at industrial policy or, or, you know, criteria for success of industrial policy in terms of output, exports, innovation, R&D, patents, and things like that, whereas I would put a lot more emphasis on actually employment. Uh, the question is, are you generating adequate employment uh, in these more productive industries that are oriented in the, into world markets? Because the kind of industrial policy then ends up generating profits, investment, uh, and R&D in a low to middle income country, uh, but at the same time, your ex, you know, ex employment is shrinking, uh, is, is not going to be uh, the, you know, the kind of high return uh, industry for uh, return activity for the economy as a whole. So I think, I think you're basically right that, that you know, I, I, I go around these days a lot less sort of advocating for very forceful industrial policy. Uh, you know, in large part because I do think that the returns to it have, have fallen. And I think also we need to think through a lot more uh, sort of what, you know, what it should look like in a world where, in fact, uh, we're concerned at least as much on, about services as, as, as manufacturing, even in the middle income or low income countries. Let me introduce one of your best known ideas. It's sometimes called Roderick's Trilemma of the World Economy. Here's how one of my readers defined it. According to this theory, democracy, national sovereignty, and global economic integration are mutually incompatible. We can combine any two of the three, but never have all three simultaneously and in full. Given that, which I would agree with, if we take the Eurozone today, something clearly isn't working. I don't mean just Greece, but every now and then we hear of a nascent recovery, and the recovery's over before it really has even gotten underway. The Eurozone is now sliding back to deflation. Uh, France, Italy seem to be slow growth countries permanently. Let's say it's up to you, given Roderick's trilemma, what should the Eurozone do? 
Well, for, you know, for, uh, academically, the, the, it's a very easy to, to give an answer. I think, you know, and, and it's what the trilemma suggests, that, that Europe or Europe's policymakers should decide whether they want... Um, oh, but they uh, ask you. They were about to decide, oh. Professor Roderick. <laughs> Please tell us which one to give up. Well, Tyler, as you know, we're very good about laying... Our job is to lay out the trade-offs, but not to decide you know, where we want to be on those. So but it's, you it's as a, a citizen, the, you're, say you're a yeah, European I'll voter. I'll tell you that too. So, but, so let me answer the first question. Yeah. The first question is, uh, I as somebody who cannot put my... You know, if I cannot put myself in the shoes of the European uh, electorate, the European citizenry, I say the choice is very clear-cut. Either more political integration or less economic integration. So that's the choice that the, you know, assuming that we don't want to give up on democracy. It's, you know, if we want to sort of subject to the constraint that we want uh, Europe to remain or, or, or re regain its thriving democracy, uh, then there, you know, this, is the cho this is the inescapable choice that the trilemma points to, which is to say you have to decide that whether you're going to politically integrate and if you're not going to politically integrate, you have to figure out a way of economically beginning at least some of this integration. Uh, and that means losing the, the, the monetary integration uh, uh, in, in particular. Now, you ask me which would be my, uh, my, my uh, preference. My preference certainly would have been before this crisis or well into the crisis, a year or two into the crisis, would have been this is the opportunity where you just basically sort of go to your uh, electorates and say, this is why we need to federalize Europe. This is why we need to politically integrate. This is why we need not just banking uh, integration, but we also need significant amount of fiscal integration and the creation of pan-European uh, political uh, space. So that's your first choice, is full that steam ahead with integration. Full steam ahead with, poli with political integration to back up uh, or the, the significant amount of economic integration that already exists. But now you've seen three or four more years. We know one of Roderick's principles is economics is almost always about the second, third, or 17th best. And what do you choose today? Uh, I, I'm afraid, I, you know, that, that, and I say this, you know, you know, very, very reluctantly, that uh, I do think that, uh, that for a number of countries at least, that um, a, a loosening of the, um, of the restraints of, of monetary integration, uh, of a common currency. So you uh, create maybe. a graceful path out of the euro well, of course, that's the nations. difficulty because it's very difficult to figure out what that grace, if, if in fact that graceful path sure. uh, exists. But yes, uh, you know, sort of laying that aside, um, you know, those transitional costs aside, uh, I think, you know, at this point, I just do not see the kind of, you know, European integration was always a, a, an elite project. Uh, European integration was never something that the people demanded. And then, you know, the you know, leaders said, okay, we will do whatever you ask. But it was always a, an elite project when, when the, uh, you know, the, the, the governmental leaders sold to their, um, to their, to their population, to their uh, electorate. I think what happened with the Euro crisis uh, is that um, somebody like Merkel instead of, of, of going out and saying, look, this is not a, a, a crisis of sort of, um, you know, a, you know it's, it's not a, 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 you know, a moral issue that, that, you know, here you have a profligate, you know, a country that is, uh, that we need to sort of uh, discipline, but this is really a crisis of interdependence that, that you know, it was as much as a German problem or German uh, banks that are, you know, the source of the problem as the as the Greeks who borrowed or the Spaniards who borrowed. Uh, that line was never put forth to the German uh, population. It was always became sort of the, the the moralistic narrative of the North versus South, and I think that's sort of that's where the political elite, uh, you know, failed uh, in Europe. And I think with that, it's very difficult to see now how you're going to undo that in, in Europe, unfortunately. So let's say you're China, you're on the ruling council. They haven't even discarded democracy yet. <laughs> so maybe they're sitting in Roderick's bilemma or, or dilemma, whatever it would be called. And they're trying to maintain capital controls, but there's more phony invoicing all the time, exports running through Hong Kong, a lot of chicanery, people trading money out through Bitcoin, a lot of leakage. In the last few months, they've spent three or 400 billion of reserves. It's real money uh, trying to keep 
the value of their currency up, it still doesn't seem to be working. In the past, you've argued eloquently capital controls often make a good deal of sense. Their capital controls now, should they double down and defend the value of the yuan at all costs, or should they let it go, open up the capital account, and see what the new value of the currency will be? Um, you know, I, I don't think You're in charge, this is, again. Um, yeah, no, I would not <clears throat> do anything hasty on the, on the capital controls front at all. Um, I, I don't think that the Chinese have uh, mismanaged this uh, as, as, as badly as um, often it is described in the, in, the, in the financial press. I agree with that. Um, and I think you know, that there was a, a, you know, a run-up in the, in the stock market, uh, and, and they, were sort of, they did a bunch of things to, to try to um, uh, prop the bubble, and, and eventually they did. Uh, and maybe sort of it went a little <coughs> bit too far. And, and so, but, you know, but they did more or less the right things in this whole process, and they've, they've allowed the, uh, the currency in the last few years to, to move uh, more freely. Um, so I think you know, you know, they, they're, they're true to their policy roots, which have um, paid off very handsomely over the last three decades. I mean, I think the last thing that we outsiders should do is second guess. Um, the wisdom of Chinese economic policy making. You know, we're, we're talking about the country that, that has engineered, you know, the history's, um, you know, uh, sort of most miraculous poverty reduction program ever. Um, and and, 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 and let's say another $300 billion of reserves go out the door to keep the peg. Your phone rings in Cambridge, You're Mass. Starting from three hundred billion dollars, you know, it's it's nothing. <laughs> it's just a drop in the bucket. Why did they, you know, accumulate those reserves to begin with? So obviously, yeah. I mean, it's not like they're running out of reserves. So it's not the issue. Um, and 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 if they weren't losing some reserves, I mean, that's part of the optimal adjustment. I mean, it's not, you know. So that, I'm not, you know, I, I don't see any reason. I think there is, I, I you know, if you ask me sort of, you know, tell me why I should be worried about China. I can give you real reasons why I should be worrying about China relating to the fact that they, in fact, have both a huge political transformation ahead of them as well as a huge economic transformation. Uh, the political transformation being the one of having to open up eventually, become uh, more democratic, and we have no idea how they will manage that. The economic transformation, which they have not uh, um, uh, really gotten you know, underway serious, well, they've started, but it's really uh, there at the very beginning, is how to turn into a more of a domestically consumer-oriented, you know, sort of less investing, more consuming uh, kind of economy and less dependent on the world market. Those are hugely challenging problems. Um, managing, you know, sort of the, the currency right now, the financial sort of, you know, this the stock market, which is a tiny, tiny part of the Chinese economy. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it pales, I think, in comparison to those bigger issues. Let's take Milton Friedman's dilemma, which is, in a way, an early version of Roderick's trilemma. So Friedman argued there was a natural tension between high levels of immigration and the welfare state. And you see this quite sharply now in Western Europe. In some ways, you see it in the United States, even though our immigration has not been up lately. But the tension is there. So if politically it turned out that you had to choose, you know, at the margin, cutting back immigration or cutting back the welfare state, you as a citizen, the economist cannot say. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would, you know, I start from the, the, uh, the supposition that borders matter. Borders have moral significance. Um, so I, I find, so I accept the notion that, uh, let's say, we as a democracy or, 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 or our citizens don't, won't necessarily put the same weight on somebody on the other side of the border as they do uh, somebody who's their neighbor or share the same political system. Uh, but so, you can if you choose to. Uh, but I can if yeah. I choose to. So the question I ask myself is this. Um, uh, let's suppose that um, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the trade-offs, let's suppose, is, is as you've put it, which is that I can bring, we can allow some people to come in, and those who are coming in are going to be better off, potentially at the cost of some of my own uh, co-nationals uh, being worse off. Um, 
my, my answer is that at the margin, this is a relatively easy question to answer because I say, okay, um, how much weight would I have to place um, on somebody on the other side of the border relative to somebody on my side of the border uh, for me not to let that person in? And if you do the calculation, which I've done recently, which is to say, sort of, let me just be careful about, let me, let me be clear about what I'm saying. I'm asking the question, under what kind of weighting of outsiders would it be a bad idea for me not to let some more people to come in? And the answer is that I would have to put a weight of less than one-fifth of somebody on the other side of the border compared to somebody here. And then I say, look, you know, I might understand that it's reasonable to say, okay, you know, it's, it's, I, maybe, I, maybe I care twice as much as somebody who's my neighbor, as somebody who's not, but five times as much? I'm not so sure. So that seems like excessive. So given how restrictive and how high these barriers are at the moment, at the margin, to me, it's a relatively easy answer, which is to say, yes, at this point, it makes sense for rich countries to take in more, uh, uh, more people from the poor countries. Uh, and, and, and to put it in a somewhat sort of, to, to draw an analogy between the uh, trade regime, what has happened in terms of trade liberalization and the migration regime. Uh, the migration regime today is more or less where the trade regime was back in the 1950s. And back in the 1950s, the, you know, sort of the, gl the global gains from further liberalizing of trade relative to you know, sort of the income distributional costs within countries and so forth was relatively huge. Um, and I think the migration regime is, is, is somehow it, you know, sort of back there. And we need to sort of you know, rationalize it and liberalize it uh, a little bit more. I'm, I'm evading the tougher question, of course, which is, okay. which is you know, where would you stop? Uh, so it's easier to, for me to answer at this point, you know, the, the regulations are too restrictive. Uh, but where would you actually stop? Um, I would definitely, I would certainly stop at a point where the integrity of uh, public institutions and, and the welfare systems of, of the advanced countries would be seriously threatened. I, but I don't know where that is. Now, I would say today, Germans are a relatively cosmopolitan people on the world stage. How well will the absorption of 800,000 plus Syrians go in Germany? What is your opinion? Well, I mean, I think they have, they have absorbed uh, more Turks uh, over um, the, the sort of the 1960s and 1970s. And um, uh, look at the German, nas that German scale, national a team. F, I mean, it's, uh, how uh, well has it gone in your view? Turkish absorption into Germany? Uh, from the st I mean, I think it's gone actually remarkably well. And there, there's certainly you know, uh, you know, s some lessons that could be drawn from that. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, you know, I, I, I don't know anybody who would sort of would say that this has been you know, a terrible mistake for Germany. Um, I think they've certainly have, have enriched. Uh, I mean, leaving it aside their economic contribution, they've, they've, uh, they've en enriched German life. Uh, so it's, uh, I think that's the most direct uh, comparison and analog is, is what happened with the, with the Turkish uh, inflow of the 60s and 70s. And that was huge. I, I don't remember offhand what the numbers are, but certainly um, I, it was huge. And it, it's, it's worked quite well. Now, you were born in Turkey. You grew up in Turkey. I have so many questions about Turkey to ask you. But let me just try two or three. Let's take the Turkish city of Konya. Now, I've been to Konya. Outsiders sometimes call Konya the, the Bible Belt of Turkey. I'm not sure that's a good comparison, but it's a more religious city than Istanbul. It's a, a kind of heartland city in Turkey. And just the simple question, I, I would put it this way. Do you trust the median voter in Konya? So if you think about Turkey's troubles, if Turkey were truly ruled by the median voter in Konya, to what extent would things would be would things be fine? Or to what extent is the problem it's not really democratic enough? Do you see what I'm asking? Because in some obvious ways, the current regime is not very democratic, even though there are elections of a sort. But do you trust the median voter in Konya? I, I do trust the median voter in, in Konya, as, as I would trust the median voter in any country. Um, however, I, I think when you think about uh, democracy, it's, it's, it's not just about the median voter. I think. 
and, and this is why I'm working on this topic, on, on the question of, of liberal democracy, uh, it, it's that, that, uh, that uh, the things about democracy that we really care about are just a twofold. One is that we want the median voters' views to be reflected. Uh, the second is, you know, we don't want to allow the median voter to do whatever he or she wants uh, to the rest of the population. Um, and that's why I think the, the constraints uh, that liberalism or the of liberal institutions, the rule of law, the constraints on uh, of, of non-discrimination uh, of, of minorities of ideological or ethnic or religious uh, sort, uh, those are equally important parts of well-functioning democracies. And one thing that has happened in uh, countries like um, uh, Turkey, which is actually a very uh, you know, uh, widespread phenomenon around the world is as the franchise and elections have spread around the world, uh, you know, by, you know, the count of sort of the polity, uh, which is sort of, you know, this uh, um, group that, that keeps track of this. We have now more democracies than autocracies in the world, but they're all electoral democracies. They're democracies precisely in the sense that you meant, which is that you have elections regularly and they've generally, you know, free and fair. Um, but uh, what they do, however, is that they allow the winners of those elections to more or less freely temple, temple on the rights uh, of those who are not part of that winning majority. Uh, so the, the liberal element of that democracy is, is really what's missing. So I'm all for empowering the, um, the, the, the median voter in, in, in Turkey or elsewhere, uh, but all uh, in the context of, of rules and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and practices uh, that ensure equal treatment of minorities of all kind. Um, and that's really the part um, that I think, for example, the whole political economy literature uh, on, on democracy um, has, has missed out on because it's essentially it's just you know sort of uh, thinking about it in terms of elections and the median voter, not thinking about it in terms of of uh, of, of uh, these restraints on what the median voter can do. So thinking in terms of minorities, if we go to the Eastern Mediterranean in times past, today's Izmir was once Smyrna. It was a fantastically cosmopolitan city. Greeks, Armenians. People from all over the Middle East, Westerners, lived there. It was for quite a while in harmony. The earlier Ottoman Empire was quite a cosmopolitan place in many parts. Again, it, by its time, fair degree of harmony. And in the early part of the 20th century, that changes very fundamentally. You have some very violent events, and it's never gone back. Do you think it's possible for the Eastern Mediterranean to be an area where these civil minorities have protection? Or do you think the more monoglot version, sort of Turks plus Kurds, now plus refugees, is simply what we're going to have? I mean, how do you think about that whole change? A great, terrible, unfortunate development? Or somehow it, it's a bit like the European 17th century, great human tragedy, but a, a clearing out that enabled nation states to, in some way, move forward? Yeah, so it, it is, you know, the big change, of course, was nationalism and the creation of the nation state. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, that the, the, the old <laughs> order was a particularly desirable one. Uh, it, it, it is one that, of course, um, s significantly circus circumscribed uh, what the Greeks or the Armenians or the Jews or the other minorities were allowed to do in these multinational uh, empires. So it, it, you know, it's not like you know, this um, you know, wonderful ancien uh, regime that, uh, you know, that we can't resuscitate. Um, and, and of course, the forces of nationalism and the creation of the nation state, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, moved us into this new world, um, where you know I think what happened in in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, as in so many other parts mm -hmm. of the world, uh, was that um, uh, you had the mobilization of the masses under sort of a nationalist rubric. Uh, it, relatively early in terms of historical development compared to Western uh, European countries. For example, in Western Europe, you had, you know, sort of liberal ideas developed before the franchise became a mass franchise. Uh, so in fact, in Britain and Western Europe, uh, you know, sort of the liberals didn't want, liberalism existed before democracy came into being. Uh, 
Uh, whereas, of course, uh, in, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, places like Turkey, we're trying to create liberalism after you had a nationalist um, a mobilization and the creation of democratic-like regimes based on, 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 on the mass franchise. And, and that's sort of, it's harder to bring those ideas of, of tolerance, the separation of powers, the rule of law, and so forth, relatively later in the game. Uh, and that's what's happening. Uh, but it is not impossible. You know, one of the places that I'd like to talk about, uh, in fact, I talk about this in, in, in my latest paper on, on liberal democracy, is, is the, ki the case of Lebanon uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Lebanon, until 1975, was a fascinating example of, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't exactly liberal democracy because it was sort of based on these different groups. Uh, they each had their you know, shares in power and constitutionally they were each allocated um, it was sort of seats and then. Uh, but it was, you know, the, the political scientists writing about Lebanon in the 60s and 70s talked about it as a liberal democracy. The reason was because uh, you know, you had so many different groups, so many cross-cutting cleavages. You had the Muslims and Christians. The Christians were between the Greek Orthodox and the, and the, and the Muslims between the Shia and the Sunni. So there were so many of these cross-cutting cleavages uh, that they essentially had reached a modus operandi, uh, that no individual group had this notion that if simply they could prevail, then they could rule forever. And when you don't have that expectation, then you work out bargains uh, with alternatives uh, because you're afraid of what the other side is going to do to you when they come to power, if they have a chance of doing that. Um, and of course, how that system came to an end is also interesting because you know once you had the massive influx of, of uh, Palestinian refugees uh, from Jordan, that balance was upset. So you now have one group that can has potentially can see itself as having a, a majority for an indefinite period of time. So no longer has to essentially uh, uh, keep on with that basic compromise. And that's how sort of the Lebanese uh, consociational system uh, came to an end uh, after 1975 with the Civil War. Uh, but at least, you know, that gives you an idea of, of you know, the, the possibilities uh, that this, I don't think this is cultural. I don't think this has anything to do necessarily with Islam. You know, it's not in the water. Uh, you, know, th you know, these things uh, can, uh, uh, can happen, but you need this experience of sort of learning to um, compromise and, and, and to think that you need to be, you know, sort of moderate in your policies because it might be that some other group will rule after you so that, you know, you have this, if you will, these repeated game incentives uh, to, to basically, you know, not uh, discriminate against those not in power uh, and very much. Um, and I, I can certainly come up with scenarios for Turkey where this might have developed over time. Um, and, uh, and I would you know, have to blame sort of a successive sort of mistakes made by, by political leaderships at different times as to why this process has of so often been short-circuited. First, of course, the military by intervening, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, repeatedly and therefore short-circuiting this process of building up these habits of, you know, regular change in power and therefore moderation and compromise developing. And, so, and, and of course, these days with the, the government of, of uh, um, Erdogan, um, who basically has just, you know, chosen the tactic that, uh, you know, do anything to remain in power, including, uh, you know, sort of aggravate all the cleavages on the basis of, of, of uh, sect, on the basis of, of uh, nationality, and so forth. So what then is the equilibrium with the Kurds? They're scattered across several nations. It's a burning issue in Turkey. Even within Kurdish circles, there are multiple languages and different points of view. Uh, do you see that as headed towards something like Lebanon and it's more vital, feistier time, or do you see it going very badly wrong? The Kurds, Turkey, and to some extent Kurds and Iraq, will there be a Kurdish state, and is there any equilibrium at all? I don't think, I, I, I think it's very unlikely that there will be a redrawing of the borders uh, formally. I, I see that as a, as a very remote possibility. Um, you know, I think there was a possibility that um, that the Turkish government, um, you know, would have reached a, a modus vivendi um, with um, with the Kurds and 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 um, uh, some kind of resolution in the same way that you know the sort of the, the Basque problem in in Spain was resolved. Um, 
And I, is I, that I, resolved? I think, <laughs> by, by, you, know, it, you know, they're not asking for independence. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, um, so, you know, and, and, you know, there's not terrorism in the streets every day. So I think in that way, I think, um, you know, it's been, you know, the, the, in, in that sense, it's, it's been resolved. Whereas the problem with, with, with the Kurdish problem right now in Turkey is terrible. I mean, it's, you know, terror, you know sort of violence has flared up again um, and, and so forth. So we're, we're back to some of the worst uh, uh, kind, kind of conflict. Uh, but I don't think it, there, there is something, you know, deeply structural that prevents uh, the kind of compromise. I think the, 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 you know, sort of the Kurdish nationalists are, in Turkey at least, are, are, can, are very, you know, clear-sighted in, in understanding that, uh, um, you know, that, that full independence is, is neither uh, in their interest nor something that they're likely to get. Um, and, uh, and the kinds of things that they do want realistically are, are not things that the Turkish national government could not give up. Uh, so there is no, no fundamental problem as to why that cannot be resolved uh, if it is not being exploited for political reasons. Right now, for example, what's happening is that Erdogan is exploiting uh, the Kurdish uh, problem as a way of building up his own nationalist base. Um, and that's sort of is being used, that particular cleavage is being used for, for political purpose. Uh, but, you know, one can imagine all other political strategies, other winning strategies that would involve um, compromise. Orhan Pamuk, by far the most famous Turkish author today. Overrated or underrated? What's your take? <laughs> you know, I, I have to say, um, I, I have never been able to finish one of his books. Uh, <laughs> this, 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 is, this is not true. I, the only, there's one that I finished, and, but that, this is actually was a, a, uh, wasn't a fiction. It's, it was his memoirs of Istanbul. And I did finish that because he grew up in the part of town which is very close to where I grew up too. So it was, you know, I could have associate. But his novels, I have to say, are, are you know, I find convoluted and, and sort of going around and around and around in circles. So I'm not, I'm not a big Orhan Pamuk fan. I love his older brother, by the way, who's an economic historian, who's a very distinguished economic <laughs> historian, uh, Chef Ket Pamuk, and, and I finished a, a lot of his books. <laughs> So who's your favorite novelist? You know, I, I've, I, I, I love uh, John le Carré. Um, I, I think I've read probably every, every one of his, of his novels. Um, I like Ian McCoon a lot. Um, uh, um, I'm reading Jonathan Franzen's book, uh, Purity, right yes. now, which... Uh, uh, which I, I enjoy. I, I, I like sort of it, it, it draws you in. Um, if we, we take Le Carre's vision of how a spy agency works, is that Roderick-esque political economy? Or does it force you to revise your views of politics? No, no, it, it's, uh, you know, it's very human, right? I mean, it's just the mundane and, and the, the, the small things that happen. So I, I'm, it, it's... it's uh, it's a very good way of actually putting it because there's probably, I, I had not thought of this until you said it, Tyler. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great point that there's a lot of political economy in John Le Carre's description of how these sort of bureaucracies uh, operate and, and, and the, the personal relationships and so forth. So I have to, I have to think about it. But um, no, I mean, I, my view of, of sort of, you know, I, I've never had the starry eyed view of, uh, you know, how government <laughs> agencies operate. Uh, uh, so you know, it, you know, it's it's not one that 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 is jarring with respect to my to my own worldview. <laughs> if I think of your work as a whole, I always like to ask this question about thinkers: What's the underlying current which ties a lot of the different parts together? And one thing that struck me going through your work, is, by the way, this pile is a small fraction of your work, and I feel sorry for my assistant who had to print it all out. Uh, <laughs> But even a lot of your papers that don't mention Turkey at all, I guess personally, I read them as asking the question, why hasn't Turkey become a, a fully free and modern society? So even if I think of your work on premature deindustrialization, if I think of Turkey in the 19th century, a big theme for my, my understanding is that Turkey is then prematurely industrializing, and that's why the Ottoman Empire becomes the sick man of Europe. So I read a lot of your papers as looking at this elephant from different sides, even if not about Turkey at all. Would you respond to that? Do you think that's a fair characterization? I, I think, I, I think that's, that's very perceptive. I mean, I think, 
you know, from my first foray into social science, I mean, I think that has been the question uh, that has been that I've, I've been motivated by. I mean, just to, to back up a little bit, I mean, I, when I was growing up in Turkey in high school, of course, you know, social science was probably the last thing on my mind just because of the way that, you know, social science is taught in, in, in Turkish schools, you know, sort of rote memorization and so forth. So I don't, that wasn't fun. And just, and like, um, like all, um, all Turkish kids of my generation with, with, you know, with some academic pretensions or at least relatively good in school, sort of my, you know, my, my, uh, my goal was to do engineering. So I came to Harvard as an undergraduate to study engineering, only to find out that there's actually no engineering major <laughs> at Harvard. Um, and, uh, and, and Not then, yet. <laughs> and, and, uh, right. Um, and then I discovered the library and the books and the fact that they had more books in Turkish uh, on Turkey uh, and Turkish history uh, in Widener Library than I could ever possibly find uh, in, in Turkey. And, that, and then I started taking courses in political science and economics, and, and it just you know, opened up to me what it meant to be sort of like thinking about these social, economic, and political questions. But the, the, the one thing that sort of you know, motivated me always was, you know, was this question of why was Turkey relatively poor and, and not developed, and, and the rest of the world, and, and the United States or Western Europe developed. So that, that is where... G given this motivation, let me ask you for the, the simplest, crudest version of your answer. We all know boiling things down to a sentence is a horrible oversimplification, and you above virtually all other economists are about the complex and the multifaceted. But nonetheless, if you had to give us the super boiled down version of why hasn't Turkey become a more or less fully free and modernized society, what would it be? Um, you know, I, for, well, I, let and me give you the, the, the answer. The, the, give us the, the, answer, the super short, there's the, there's and then a, we'll give you I'll, follow-up. I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you the, the, um, you know, the general answer to that question, uh, not for Turkey, but for countries like Turkey. And, and my general sort of question would be 50% structure, 50% agency. Uh, which is to say, you know, you, you start with a lot of, you know, initial conditions that aren't uh, very favorable. So going back to the 19th century, you start on the wrong end of the global division of labor. Everybody else is mm -hmm. industrialized and you're not, plus then the British come and they open up your trade regime. You have to, you know, all the craft industries you have in the 18th century are just decimated because of uh, imports from Britain and other Western Europeans. Uh, and then you get defeated in, in, a, in a world war. Um, so, you know, so there, you, you start with very inaus inauspicious circumstances. Um, and then, you know, agency, you know, 50 percent, you know, what happened, for example, under Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who was sort of the, you know, the, the leader, you know, who made Turkey, who you know, took Turkey from, uh, you know, the ashes of the Ottoman Empire, erected the Turkish Republic uh, uh, on top of that. You know, he, you know, he did a lot of very good things and a lot of, you know, very silly things. And we're still living with uh, the consequences of many of those things, including the good things. I mean, the fact that Turkey is a relatively secular country um, with a large middle class to a large extent is, is, is um, you know, the result of his top-down, extremely brutal, uh, you know, extremely, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, narrow-minded view of what it meant to be a modern nation state. Basically, take, you know, the Swiss civil code and the French criminal code and just, you know, the German commercial code and just, you know, you know apply it. Um, and, uh, and, and part of, and, and, but also a lot of the problems that we are having are also the residue of the fact that, you know, in that rigid view of how to modernize, uh, he pushed out uh, a lot of the people who need to be included back into the Turkish polity, including uh, the conservatives, the religious conservatives, and, 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 um, and, and a lot of others, and the Kurds. But if I look at Europe as a whole, there seems to be a line somewhere. Maybe it's at Slovenia, Croatia, you can debate where, where the line is. But east of that line, you don't see full development. And that at least suggests to me, it's not mostly agency. There's something structural. Because to think the leaders or the citizens in these different countries all made the same mistake, it doesn't quite fit my other views about the world. So if you're comparing Eastern and Western Europe, again, this isn't only about Turkey. It's not about Ataturk. 
You could say the same about most of Eastern Europe, except possibly Poland. Uh, what's that fundamental difference between West and East that is giving rise structurally to whatever percent of the explanation you want to assign to structural forces? You know, I would go back to, to people like Barrington Moore, who tried to explain um, sort of why is it that um, you know, Western Europe, Britain sort of developed democratic institutions and, and, uh, and it became very difficult elsewhere in Central Europe um, uh, to do the same. I think a lot of what he said um, had to do with the nature of sort of, you know, how did market forces and, and social structures interact? In particular, what was the mode of commercialization of agriculture? So if you had, you know, you started out with commercial, with, with uh, you know, sort of peasant agriculture, um, small uh, scale farms, um, and, uh, and, and landlords that, uh, you know, sort of, you know, weren't interested in labor repressive agriculture, who diversified into commercial businesses in urban areas. Uh, as in Britain, you got a very different kind of, of path of industrialization and political development. Uh, where you got uh, sort of, you know, large uh, sort of commercial estates, large landlords, uh, you know, absentee or not, uh, interested in, in sort of labor repressive uh, you know methods of, of farming uh, who did not diversify uh, you know to a large extent into industry into commercial enterprises so allied themselves with the state so as to be able to con you know uh, continue the repression of, of, of the agri agrarian sector so your, your uh, three word answer would be structure of agriculture if we had to well, boil it down yeah I mean it has to be agriculture because that's where everything started mm -hmm. I mean so that's where everybody was so that's where the wealth was. So if you go back, but to not sort ideology. Of the 17th, so you're an oh, no, economic no, no. structuralist. Oh, this, no, this is where no. This is again. I, I think the fact that let me put it this way: <clears throat> if France was not in Western Europe but in Eastern Europe, I don't think it would be the kind of democracy or the kind of you know, industrial economy it, it it came to be. Uh, I think you know being you know sort of you know having the, the you know the Netherlands uh, in in the north and 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 Britain to the to the west I think the the, the both the competition and the benchmarking and the ideas and I think that sort of made I think in that way geography made a difference but geography because it sort of enables the 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 the, the transfer of ideas and 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 sort of who who are you looking at uh, as as sort of you know what kind of a country you want to be um, and so in many ways, you know, France had, you know, the, the initial conditions that would have made it look more like a Central or Eastern European country than a, than a Western European one. But the fact that, you know, it's part of Western Europe, I think, has to do that, that it, it was so much closer to, to Britain. Uh, you know, I think you see the same, you know, about why is it that Vietnam has developed in the way that it has after, you know, it sort of opened up its economy. I think if Vietnam was, developed, was located in Latin America or Central America, I don't think it would have been half the miracle that it was. But keep uh, in mind, but Vietnam is still poorer than Bolivia, which is the poorest country in South America. So Vietnam has yet to show it's a success. Wouldn't you bet that in, in 10 years it won't be? No, I wouldn't bet. I would say, I'd say it's an even money bet. <laughs> okay. Let's, well, let's go to a short question and answer part of the talk. I'm going to shout something out ask you whether it's overrated or underrated. You give me a short answer. Uh, you're free to pass if you want to. <laughs> As an economic method, going back to your book, your book, this book, Economic <laughs> Rules, randomized control trials as an economic method, overrated or underrated? Uh, today overrated. Give us a quick why. Uh, that's the only thing that students do these days, and I think that's not the only way we learn. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's crowding out, I think, a lot of, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, I mean, you know, I, I think it was a fantastic contribution to the economics <laughs> literature. Uh, but I think it's, it's sort of, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it's the, the marginal contribution of, of I, I think the, 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 the way that I think about it is, internal validity is not the only thing. So the, 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 the good thing about all these RCTs is that they're very good about um, uh, being able to identify causal effects. Uh, but they're very poor about saying anything about you know, 
the why is it that we get these effects, or in fact whether you know these things also the same effects would occur in other contexts in elsewhere. So it worked here. We don't know if it's going to work somewhere else, uh, and and it's going to, it's crowding out the kind of work. Um, that political economy, because it's hard to do an RCT on political economy. Uh, but even in, in micro things, I mean, I think even you know in the kinds of things where we have, we've applied RCTs, I think we, sp we should be thinking a lot harder conceptually and theoretically. Um, so there was a time, you know, when I came out of graduate school, you know, if you were doing development economics and you were doing something empirical, you could never get a job. Uh, because all the, you know, so, you know, probably in development economics at the time, you couldn't get a job, period. But uh, the point was that, you know, empir doing empirical economics would not make you sort of rise up. And, and I think that was terrible. And I think sort of we've now sort of, you know, basically moved all the way to the other extreme where empirical work also means just sort of, you know, doing something where you put 100% weight on identifying on internal validity, uh, but very little thought into issues of external validity or the, co or, or the basic uh, theory. Um, and I think, you know, we just have to correct some of that balance. Rumi, the 13th century Persian poet and his Sufi mysticism, as you know, he wrote some in Turkish. Overrated or underrated? Uh, not enough known. Nazim Hikmet, Turkish poet, famous uh, left-wing figure, flirted with the Soviet fa Union. Fantastic poet. So and underrated. Un underrated. Underrated. Yeah. The Iran nuclear deal, overrated or underrated? <laughs> <laughs> I think just right. <laughs> just right. The idea of an independent Catalonia. Uh, I, 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 a lot of my friends will hate me for saying this, but overrated. And why? Um, you know, I... I, I, again, I, my, 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 my Catalonian friends are going to hate me for this, but, you know, when I ask w what is it that they want to get out of independence, uh, it seems that that basically is just very much a, you know, sort of a sense of, of uh, having been treated very badly by Madrid, uh, that there isn't, um, that, that, it's almost like a very, uh, you know, a, a sort of a 19th century sense of, of uh, you know, nationalism uh, that is driving it. And I sort of think that we should be beyond that. And I think um, that, that, you know, in a, in a, in a thriving European Union, uh, hopefully if we get there, that, you know, that basically uh, a lot of regions can do a lot more of things that they can do on their own. And I think the, the right sort of devolution of political authority is, is up for grabs. And uh, you know, breaking up Spain, I don't think is going to to really you know help that bigger goal of having a, a politically richer and, and and deeply democratic Europe. So, so I don't see what the upside really is, except for this you know deep sense of of nineteenth century ressentiment, if you mm -hmm. What's a country right now investors are underrating and a country they're overrating in today's world? Well, I, given your I, understanding, Brazil, I think, is deeply uh, underrated right now. I, I, I think that it's when you look at what's happening. On the one hand, in Brazil, it's sort of, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it shocks you that there is you know, this, you know, this widespread corruption uh, with Petrobras that seems to go all the way up. On the other hand, when you look at how they're dealing with this situation is incredibly impressive. It's something that would, you know, that even in an advanced country you wouldn't think would happen. That you know, there you have these, you know, prosecutors and judges who are actually following the rule of There's the real law. Accountability. Uh, real accountability. Real accountability. This is not being used to settle political scores in the way that it would happen anywhere if it was happening at all. Um, and you know, they have so, industrial policy. Um, and their industrial policy isn't great, but you know they at least you know they are trying to do something yeah. about it. So that's that's a somewhat separate issue. So I think so. To me, when I look at Brazil, they're demonstrating a political maturity uh, in the way that their system operates. That is, you know, you know, decades ahead of even the advanced industrial countries. And I think the fact that they're dealing with this and that it's going to have it behind them, you know, five years from now, eventually. Is going to put them, you know, is, you know I would put in the long play for, for Brazil. So I and think overrated. Ma markets are, um, you know, I think India, mm -hmm. um, because I think that, that, that um, uh, I think the kind of growth that India has had, I don't think is sustainable. Uh, 
partly going back to our earlier discussion about uh, 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 premature industrialization. I think you know they have these plans to um, really um, significantly strengthen their manufacturing base. I just don't think I don't, I don't see it happening. I think India can grow at four or five percent per year on a sustainable basis. I just not going to. I don't think it's going to be eight to nine percent. And then when this is sort of sinks in, I think there's going to be a negative overreaction. Would be my my fear. Last question before we turn to the audience, and this again is getting back to your book. A reader wrote to me, Roderick was the Albert Hirschman professor at Princeton, and before that he received an Albert Hirschman prize. Both Hirschman and Roderick are economists who look at the same facts as everyone else, but they see what nobody else has seen. If you were allowed to make one change in the economics profession or academia, this is an institutional change or rules change, not an attitudinal change but an actual change in how things are done, and a change in a graduate program. If you could make one change to help produce more Dana Rodericks for all the rest of us, what would that be? Oh, I, I wish I had a very quick and good answer to this. But I mean, we, we, it's certainly, uh, you know, it, it's not a great answer, uh, but it it's probably would help. I mean, I think, uh, you know, do, I was helped a lot by going into economics from uh, after having done political science. Um, and I think a lot of what's wrong in economics is that it's, it's so much driven by people who first do engineering or math before they go into economics. And, and they, it's all relatively late that they get immersed into the, into the real world. So I think anything that would get them a little bit more sort of cognizant of the problems of the real world. You know, even I would say that political science, there are parts of political science that have become you know, even worse than economics right now. So I'm not sure that that would work. Uh, I don't know, maybe sort of a gap year, spending a year uh, in, a, in a developing <laughs> country between your, your, your first and second year. Uh, That's actually so, my so, idea as well. So I'm yeah? glad to hear you okay. say that. There we go. So we, we just now have to find somebody to finance it. <laughs> <laughs> We now open up to the audience. There are two mics. Please get in line. I will alternate. Please note these are questions for our guest, not lengthy statements. If you start making a lengthy statement, I will cut you off. But please head up to the mics with your questions, and I will call on you, and you will hear responses. Uh, at the mic over here, and please just announce your name also. Hi, uh, my name is Caleb Watney. Um, I'm a master's student here. And um, I'm actually considering spending the summer in a developing country. So what one would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, one that you have not been to before, uh, or, or, or one in, 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 in a continent that you haven't been to <clears throat> before. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, I always tell my students that they should always go to a country. I mean, you know, when they have that chance to spend a summer or a year uh, to, to go to somewhere which is as different from where they, they have some experience, uh, you know, as possible. Because, I mean, that, that comparative, you know, sort of, you know, there are so many things you take for granted that you don't even understand are things to be questioned. It's only when you see another country that's so different, then you start asking, but why is it, how come that is working there, it's not working here? Um, and so for that, you know, you know, as many opportunities you have to be asking that question, which is as different a place you can imagine from where you've been to. So, um, Given that I've only been in America and Mexico, <laughs> and I only have one summer, what would be the top of the list? I'm looking for specifics. You're, lo you're looking, well, I mean, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, you go to India and travel, and you will have seen so much diversity and variety. So, um, yeah. On this side. Uh, thank you. I'm Richard Rubenstein. I'm a teacher here. I have my class here, in fact, today. Uh, we are, at the moment, studying systems that produce structural conflicts. And so it makes me want to ask you, when you talk about premature deindustrialization, we're in the middle of looking at Rosa Luxemburg's work. And I wondered what your explanation is for the whether there are structural causes for premature deindustrialization. If Luxembourg were here, she would be talking about the effects of imperialism. And so I wonder what, how you would explain it. Well, it, you know, in the, of course, in the 19th century, it was, uh, you know, sort of, you know, formal and informal empire uh, that, that, you know, the various, the so-called unequal trade treaties and so forth that, that you, then you had, 
you know, India and, and, uh, and China and the Ottoman Empire, sort of all these, you know, nascent uh, textile industries uh, being decimated by, you know, imports uh, from, from Britain. Um, uh, but of course, we also have cases like uh, Japan, which in the late 19th century, despite uh, you know ha you know having very low tariffs, being able to you know develop its own domestic industry. So we have at least one exception, even back then, of of, of a country that could industrialize despite um, those uh, circumstances. The, the the 21st century, you know, the the late 20th and 21st century analog of that imperialism, if you will, is China. <laughs> because it's been China that has been essentially you know, sw you know, uh, swamping the world uh, with manufactured goods. So you go to a country like uh, you know, Ethiopia today in, in, in Africa, and, and basically everything is imported from China. So uh, you know, 50 years ago, a country like Ethiopia would be manufacturing very simple things from you know, you know, footwear to you know, uh, tables and chairs to cardboard boxes, a lot of, you know, sort of, the, uh, but now it's sort of everything is coming from China. Uh, so the fact that we have, you know, we moved to a stage of the world where a country like China is, is, is able to uh, exert such strong uh, effect on world markets in, market in, 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 in manufacturers means that the opportunities for import substitution in, in manufacturing is significantly less today uh, in, in the low income countries that have opened themselves up. So it's not Obviously, imperialism, but it's sort of like, if you will, the imperialism of free trade. This might be one way of putting it uh, for our current experience. Uh, so that's clearly one. It's also uh, in terms of the uh, the fact that earlier I was saying that that traditionally manufacturing has had the ability to absorb a lot of unskilled labor. Uh, manufacturing has become more and more capital and skill intensive over time. So that means that now. Uh, you know that you know even garments or textile footwear you know they become fairly skill intensive uh, uh, um, activities so that that you know the, the the Chinese entrepreneur I mentioned when she goes to Ethiopia and opens up a you know a, a, a footwear plant uh, she's using very different kind of labor university graduates and very few many many fewer of them uh, compared to what the Chinese experience was. Uh, so I think ch changes in technology and, and, uh, and, and globalization have been, I think, the, the two structural uh, factors behind uh, pushing for prematurity industrialization. Thank you. On this side. Hi. Uh, my name's Ethan Alsup. I'm a graduate student at the Fairfax George Mason campus. Um, give me a sec. I apologize. This is written down because I didn't want to forget sure. it. When referring to the past political situation in Lebanon, you characterized it as preferable to the current, more autocratic situation of today, in as much as a large number of cross-cutting cleavages, uh, and the mutual understanding among them to the effect that once in power, it's not necessarily guaranteed in the future, uh, or something like the mutual fear of what the other will do, um, effectively necessitated deal-making and compromise. So given this, what would be your position on nuclear pr proliferation? And aren't you, by virtue of this, sort of beholden to the position that the more countries with nukes, the more cross-cutting uh, there would be and the more effective, um, better functioning democracy? And when will Turkey have nuclear weapons? I'll just <laughs> toss that in. <laughs> Well, you're really pushing me into my you know, sort of areas of incompetence here. I have no idea to a question to. Uh, I, I, say I have no inside knowledge of, of that uh, to, to, to share. Now, um, so I think, so the, 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 Ethan, you, the question you were asking is, uh, you, you, know, you know, extending the notion that sort of more cross-cutting cleavages, you know, imply for greater political stability and, and tolerance and moderation. Can we take that idea to the international sphere, in particular, apply it to um, sort of nuclear proliferation. If more states had nuclear weapons, would that make the global, the, the world uh, safer? I, I, I'm not quite sure about the analogy, um, the way that you know you've, you've taken that that idea and, and extended to the global uh, sphere, because the notion of cross-cutting cleavages uh, has to do. Uh, op has to do with sort of, you know, when you're operating not in a state of anarchy, so to speak, but when you're operating on in a, in a, in a well-ordered, you know, sort of uh, polity. Uh, 
and I'm not sure that that analogy carries to uh, what is effectively the state of anarchy at the global level, where there is no global government. So it's, you know, the, the, the nature of competition uh, is, is very different. Um, so I mean, the, the, the idea of, of uh, prolif uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, you know, globally, you know, greatly worries me. Not on, I mean, not because I think that, you know, the marginal country is going to be uh, less responsible uh, than the countries that already have nuclear weapons, but just because the more you, you know countries you have them, uh, the greater the chance that at least one of them will be irresponsible rises. Uh, so I think just probabilistically, I think that makes me very, very nervous. Um, I think it's, it's, it's the analogy I don't think really quite applies. That's fair. Thank Next you. question. Thank you. My name is Paolo Sanjatin, graduate student of politics at Catholic University. I'm Brazilian. I have developing country experience that is more than enough, probably. Uh, thank you for your words of hope uh, on what's going down down there. Uh, still, um, besides our words of hope, uh, crony capitalism and draconian regulations are more than rule, more the rule than the exception in Brazil. I would like to know if you th you believe that Brazil is there a way of Brazil's overcoming that in those five, six years that you, that you said, or put in, in another way, do those issues actually matter? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's, it's easier, you know, it, you know, to say, it, uh, look, I come to Brazil, you know, as a Turk. I watch what's happening in Brazil. I compare it to what is happening to Turkey now. Uh, you know, it's not like, you know, Turkey has had an easy time economically, but the way that the financial markets have treated Turkey is, is incomparable. Uh, to you know how badly you know Brazil has been treated, and then I look at you know crony capitalism. Uh, you know, it's I see at least that in Brazil we have a system that's actually dealing with it and it's dealing with it in a way that's you know as clean uh, as one could hope for. Uh, what's happening in Turkey? What's happening in Turkey is that the extent of corruption and crony capitalism, the part of it that we have already seen is vastly superior than anything that has come out uh, on, in Brazil, right? So, you know, you know, we know that the president and his immediate family uh, have been, you know, greatly implicated in, you know, vast amounts of, of corruption. Uh, and we, we know that it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, the kind of thing that Dilma could be guilty of, you know, pales in comparison. Um, and, uh, and we have had, um, you know, Sort of the the fact that anything, you know, in in, in Turkey, in terms of trying to delete the judiciary, when it, it it went into sort of you know trying to clean the system up, it did it in a way that was explicitly politically motivated, uh, and therefore it made it much easier for Erdogan to actually uh, clamp down on it, uh, because it was clear that you know it was just a politically motivated attack on him, uh, so which makes neither side really right. But you know, is what what essentially uh, means that in a country like uh, Turkey, you have you basically, you're postponing all these problems into the future. They're going to hamper your development, hamper your politics for decades to come. Um, and at least in Brazil, you're just, you know, dealing with these things and you're, you're trying to overcome them. Maybe it's not be five years. Maybe you'll find other things that are happening. Uh, but, you know, at least, I, you know, I would, my recommendation to you is at least take pride uh, that you have, you know, you're, you you have a system uh, that is actually trying to clean the system, clean it up, uh, because that's really rare. You know, it's not happening in Turkey, it's not happening in Thailand, it's not happening in in you know most developing countries that I know of. Uh, so I think in that way, I think it's it's really I think uh, Brazil is exemplary. Thank you very much. Next question. My name is Elizabeth, and I'm a master's student here. I read a small excerpt about your new book, and I know that it's about economic models. Um, I was wondering how um, do you factor in just best, uh, best practice institutions, or when you consider economic models, is there room to factor in, say, in your own words, second, second best institutions, and how effective would 
would that be in the ultimate analysis of a country or a model? Look, I, you know, I, I've said this before. I, I hate the notion of best practice. I mean, I, I think this is probably, you know, a, a very harmful notion. Um, the the um, uh, I was a student of Avinash Dixit, who's, who's a great economist uh, at Princeton, and 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 he likes to say, the world is second best at best, um, and 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 uh, you know, this is you know so you always have to think in those terms, and the notion of a best practice uh, you know pr you know is based on the idea that you can simply just you know have something that worked somewhere. And, and, and take it and copy it, apply it somewhere else. Um, and, 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 and the kind, not only does that not work in general, uh, it also is, is it, it gives us a very lazy uh, you know, frame of mind. So we end up doing sort of developing all these course, you know, World Economic Forum scorecards, or we have all these sort of checklists of you know, sort of you know, the, you know, the, the, the you know, business environment rankings. Um, or, or you know even you know like these these even those uh, the sustainable development goals, um, and I think you know to, you know to some extent these things can be important because of you know, as, as as public relations as as, as PR efforts, uh, but you look at all you know successful countries and what you'll see is that you've had their societies and and leaders. Uh, who've always sort of distilled experience from elsewhere from the lens of their own local knowledge. And I think that's when you get that combination is really when things work. And, and a sort of, you know, a best practice kind of a mindset, I think, is, is, is an enemy of that. Thank you. Question here. Last question. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Shreya Shekhar. I'm an undergrad student from uh, George Washington. Uh, I just had a question. So given that uh, industrial policy largely failed in post-independence India to a great extent. Do you advise the present Indian government to go ahead with conventional industrial policy of picking winners and losers, uh, or do you do you just should they just uh, instead you know liberalize factors and focus on expanding access to capital? And uh, just just a second part, if if they do go ahead with the strategy, do you think global demand right now is strong enough to sustain and an export-based growth strategy, or will it largely fail? You have three minutes to answer for a billion people. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I would I would I would you know n you know never recommend a country to do anything conventional. <laughs> so that's that's just uh, um, so. Uh, it, <laughs> I mean, I think you know it relates to some of the things that that we were discussing. Uh, yes, I mean, I think the returns to industrial policy are lower now. The returns to any export-oriented strategy are also lower now. We haven't talked about this, but really, I think there's a sense in which the world economy isn't going to be as much of an engine uh, for growth for developing and emerging markets in the future as it has been uh, until now. Um, and, uh, as as will you know, manufacturing industry will not be that. Uh, but I don't see this trade-off between, you know, fundamentals versus, you know, sort of a, a, a more proactive government policy that's trying to, you know, generate new industries, not just manufacturing but also services. And I think, you know, you know, it's it's uh, what I always, you know, look for is 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 some kind is is a very pragmatic kind of attitude towards the private sector and the business sector, which is what, you know, government that's sort of saying, what is it that we can do to unlock possibilities? Um, and keep an open mind on that. It doesn't mean you're going to be picking winners, uh, you know, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be willing to do, you know, to get activities started that might not have started otherwise, and just, you know, some of them will fail. That's in the nature of things. Uh, but I think you know having tried and failed is better uh, often than not having tried at all, and 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 there's no trade-off really. I mean you can do that and also work on your fundamentals, on your skills, and your capital base, and your infrastructure. Certainly, as as India has to do, and Indian economic policy has very much uh, I think moved in that direction, um, and uh, you know so. Uh, I think that's fairly consistent with what the government is, is already doing, except that I think they just, ex you know, I think exaggerate, uh, you know, how much growth and how much industrialization they can really get. Thank you so much for all of those stimulating words.
There will be a book signing out front with Danny, Economics Rules. It is out this October. All of you here should buy and read it. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler.